to be here. I'm happy to see each and every one of you this morning. We are truly honored and privileged to have a, a uh, very knowledgeable person um, as it regards history in general, and especially black history, uh, Brother Lawrence Hamilton. But he spent uh, 30 years as a, uh, a teacher in the Pickle, Ohio public school system. And so I know that he's uh, well qualified and uh, uh, adept to uh, uh, render discourse on the subject matter this morning. So we would like at this time for you to uh, honor as we present and uh, to some and introduce to others, Brother Larry Hamilton, uh, who just happens to be a cousin. And uh, he came all the way down here from Pickford uh, to share with us this morning. I believe the worship service is not just a goosebump experience, but it's it's an educational experience. Where we learn, and sometimes uh, in learning, be able to see just how the hand of God has moved in our behalf in time past, and uh, be assured of the fact that um, that. The Bible said that the arm of the Lord is not shortened, that it cannot save. Uh, my Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we ask that you would give him your undivided attention as he comes. Brother Larry, where are you? Thank you so much, brother. Y'all give him a hand. I am only one but I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. Yes, what I can do, I ought to do. Mm -hmm. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, yes, I will do. All right, sir. All right. I'm thankful for the opportunity, opportunity to appear before you this morning. Mm -hmm. I thank my... Uh, not only my cousin, but my first cousin. Yes. Uh, the the uh, son mm -hmm. of my father's brother. Yes, sir. You see, these, these, these kinds of distinctions in terms of relationship are important to me. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get through this this morning. It's all right. I'm already heavy. It's all right. With a, a measure of uh, spirit. Yes, sir. And I just thank uh, Chris for allowing me to come yes, and share with you. But I, as I look out and I look at my uncle and his years yes, of service to the Lord, it's, it's so meaningful, particularly when I know and understand the trials <coughs> and the tribulations that he has had to endure. Yes, sir. I thank you for your service to the Lord. Amen. Chris, thank you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you, man. Uh, I, I've been known to say when I come on visits that uh, that's somebody's preacher right there. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So Amen. I, I'm, I'm not going to try to belabor this, but... Uh, I, I feel good this morning. So uh, I, I particularly uh, want to uh, share with some of you who may not be aware uh, that I taught a black history course at Piqua High School for 30 consecutive years. Now that doesn't maybe impress uh, the minds of many, but uh, Piqua is about like Loveland, <laughs> even uh, more so perhaps, it's about 95% uh, white. And uh, I was invited uh, from a HBCU, Central State University, to come and teach a black history course uh, for 30 consecutive years. And uh, I think that there is some level of distinction there because I don't know of any other 
public school in the nation that has permitted from a overwhelmingly Eurocentric perspective, mm -hmm. the opportunity to have teach mm -hmm. a black history course for 30 consecutive years. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we, we uh, honor uh, those people who uh, made that happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in many respects, it's the uh, uh, people of color who uh, <coughs> insisted that we were worthy Yes, of that kind of uh, uh, opportunity to understand whose we are. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to move uh, yes. too long, but I, I do want to, you know, address some of these uh, issues and areas of my concern. Uh, I, I do want to also point out to you the uh, uh, symbolism associated with uh, what you see on the screen here. Uh, I, I have been in my small way attempting to uh, recognize and value and glorify uh, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. And I have attempted to uh, share that kind of mentality in terms of service and spirituality in praying mm -hmm. that I can be of service to the community. Yes, sir. Uh, it's important that we know whose we are. Yes, sir. Uh, and that that matters who we are. Yes, sir. Uh, and that's, that's why it's important for us to grasp uh, yes. and identify with uh, our roots. Mm -hmm. And it's important for me that people without knowledge of their past uh, is like a tree without roots. Yes, sir. Amen. I want to share a little bit with you uh, this morning about Blacks in Loveland, but because we're coming out, out of uh, Black History Month, which is February, mm -hmm. we are now, of course, in uh, March, and March is, of course, Women's History Month. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, again, uh, owe so much mm -hmm. to the uh, memory Yes. of some and and uh, the presence of uh, my dear mother mm -hmm. uh, who has uh, made such a sacrifice on my behalf yes, that has allowed me mm -hmm. in turn to serve the community yes, uh, that I uh, wanted to uh, uh, honor mm -hmm. uh, by way of uh, paying tribute to our ancestry. Yes, uh, and memorializing the struggle of those who've gone before us. So uh, you see here uh, uh, the Sankofa symbol, which uh, uh, symbolizes the ability to look back and to uh, retrieve that which has been taken from us and to move forward with that in uh, service on a contemporary basis and into the future. So that that's an important symbol and the women who you see there uh, have been central. They have been foundational to my uh, development yes, uh, in service to uh, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ first, but then uh, supplemental to that, of course, uh, the community of color. Yes, sir. <clears throat> We come into uh, March, which is Women's History Month, uh, on the heels of uh, Black History Month, and we want you to understand and appreciate uh, the contribution of Carter G. Woodson. Uh, Carter G. Woodson is known as the father of Black history, and so we need to honor uh, his uh, uh, contribution to the expansion of knowledge uh, that has been made available through his efforts and those who have followed behind him. Uh, Carter G. Woodson is a graduate of Berea College. Now, I mention that simply because uh, our family history 
is connected to that prestigious liberal arts uh, college in Kentucky. Amen. Uh, and uh, uh, Cynthia Ross Hannon mm -hmm. uh, attended uh, Berea College and became the first teacher uh, among the Hamilton family. Uh, I, I, I turned on my computer, this computer, every morning with her face looking back at me. Yeah. And serving as a uh, means to inspire me in terms of what are you going to do today? Yeah. <laughs> How is it that you're going to respond to the challenges that are before you. So it's women like Cynthia Ross Hannon uh, that we would pay homage and uh, honor to uh, on this occasion. We also want to acknowledge the uh, role of Henry Allen Lane now, Grandma Esther uh, loved her cousin, Henry Allen Lane, uh, who followed her mother uh, to Berea College. So our, our family group is uh, very much associated with and tied to uh, Berea College. And if you're ever heading south uh, and, and you come on, on that exit, take the time to stop and just drive through the uh, uh, campus area and, and get a feel mm. for the spirit on the part of those who uh, had gone before us yes. and who have sacrificed on our behalf in that struggle for freedom. As I was saying, Cynthia Ross Hannon was the first uh, to attend college. Now she did that just one generation after slavery. Uh, Lucy, my great-great-grandmother, uh, was responsible for allowing her daughter to attend Berea College. Now, that may not sound like much, but she had four sons. She was the only girl and she was the only one to attend college mm. and become a teacher. Mm. That's a remarkable accomplishment at that particular time. Yes, sir. Okay. And the person that I, of course, have to have so much uh, love and respect for in terms of her uh, inspiration and encouragement to me is of course my grandmother yeah. Esther Hannon Hamilton the daughter of Cynthia Ross Hannon uh, Grandma Esther uh, was the foundation the matriarch of the uh, Hamilton family group and uh, I had the good pleasure of uh, attending Wright State University to work on my master's degree mm -hmm. and uh, was uh, placed on the uh, uh, Belinga Cultural Center uh, mailing list yeah. and received this mail in 1975. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew it was going to be something big. I anticipated that it was going to be associated with Malcolm X because Alex Haley wrote the autobiography of Malcolm X and uh, uh, and so I actually took students from Pickwell High School to attend that program because I anticipated that we were going to get a lesson in black history from the standpoint of uh, discussion relating to Malcolm X that's not what Haley talked about. Haley was talking about this new book that he had been researching and working on and was ready to introduce to the public. That new book was called Roots. And when I heard him that night, 
I called my grandmother as soon as I got home. I said, Grandma, I'm coming home this weekend. I need to sit down and talk with you. Because I just heard a man telling a story about his grandmother and the impact that she had had on him in connection with those old stories leading to the narrative Kunta Kinte. Now I'm going to come home. I want to bring a, a tape recorder and I want to sit down and talk with you and I want you to tell me some of those old stories that I didn't have sense enough to sit down and listen to yeah. back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> but now I'm ready. And, 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 and I'm ready with a purpose in terms of being able to serve the interests of others within the community. This is my grandmother. This is Esther Hannon Hamilton. This is the mother of our elder here, uh, uh, Uncle Ralph Hamilton. This is the uh, grandmother of so many others and great grandmother of so many others who are in this audience. And uh, uh, I just want to encourage you to be receptive and, and, and open to uh, the sharing on the part of elders uh, in your uh, households. Uh, seek out their wisdom and knowledge. Uh, and uh, it can be a, a source uh, of uh, inspiration and or aspiration, as my uh, uh, cousin was uh, uh, referring to in, in terms of uh, asking if I wanted to uh, come and uh, share this morning. When I was uh, growing up down at the other church, uh, I would go to Sunday school with my grandmother. And uh, occasionally she would uh, encourage uh, some of the grandkids to come and go with her uh, to these uh, various locations uh, that were part of the uh, uh, Tate's Creek Baptist Association. And as I grew a little older, uh, I appreciated going with Grandma, not so much being with Grandma, but being in the presence of so many young women. And, and uh, you know, uh, at that time they said, well, when we go to Kentucky, uh, Kentucky's uh, uh, a place of uh, fast women and pretty horses. <laughs> Is that what they said? No, maybe it was uh, the other way around. I'm not sure. <laughs> But in any event, I, I appreciated going to Kentucky and these uh, 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 Tate's Creek Baptist associations, but I learned so much <laughs> about who I was. Yeah. And uh, Grandma was always interested in uh, trying to you know, point out, well, that's such and such, and that's so-and-so, that's your cousin over there. And, and, and if she hadn't done that, I never would have had the kind of connection and uh, the kind of uh, uh, knowledge uh, that uh, it was important for me to be about grasping. But this is just one of those occasions. I, if, you, if you can look, you can see that I'm present with my grandmother uh, at the Lachlan Church and uh, these uh, Tate's Creek Baptist Associations, they move from one place to another. Uh, from Loveland to Lachlan to uh, uh, Warsaw to uh, Lowell to Richmond to uh, Stone Point, various places. And uh, many of the people at these particular locations or places were related. And they came out of the same historical heritage of enslavement in Garrett County, in Madison County, Kentucky. Want to encourage you to develop uh, pictorial uh, pedigree charts 
these kind of tell the story of our lineage. Uh, uh, you start with yourself and uh, move back in, in terms of exploring all the aspects of the uh, stories that or narratives that are part of your uh, family history. And uh, uh, for this particular occasion, I started with my son, uh, moved up to my nuclear family unit. My father and mother were above uh, me there. Above my father is his mother, Esther Hannon Hamilton. And interestingly enough, this is one of the important reasons why Loveland is so important to me. And First Missionary Baptist and uh, uh, the, the uh, Loveland Predestinary Baptist uh, churches, uh, all family gathered within these uh, 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 spiritual uh, places of worship, okay? So for my mother, if you went across, you can see her father, and uh, that's Matthew Green, who was a member of uh, uh, First Missionary Baptist. Uh, you can see his mother, Mary Benton Green, uh, and uh, his father, uh, Willie Roy Green and if you move down below Matt Green you can see uh, Fannie Mae O'Reilly <coughs> Green who is my mother's mother mm -hmm. now most of you remember you know uh, Uncle Matt as some of you would say uh, or uh, as, as having uh, a, another wife uh, my mother's mother died when she was about five or six years old. Mm -hmm. And so the only grandmother I really knew who was married to my grandfather was Marcia Green, uh, whom I dear, dearly loved also. But uh, if we moved on across, you can see a five generation uh, picture there. Uh, and and uh, you can see Matt Green uh, with sitting uh, with uh, Amanda Green and and uh, my aunt, my mother's sister, Aunt Robin, and then uh, Mama Jenny. For those of you who are old enough to recall and remember her, and of course uh, little Dirk. And uh, Dirk is uh, uh, he completed that uh, that last. Uh, generation spot there but this is a picture of Lucy Sam's Ross this is uh, uh, Cynthia Ross's mother the lady I was telling you about who uh, attended Berea and became a teacher and uh, this uh, was taken shortly before uh, her death in 1924 uh, she was born in 1847 and uh, she uh, was born uh, the uh, uh, slave master's daughter, which you can associate with uh, the uh, complexion uh, on the part of uh, Lucy. But Lucy was, uh, that story was the story that my grandmother shared with me that resulted in um, three books that we collectively uh, labeled as Lucy's story. But Lucy's story was a story about Camp Nelson, Kentucky. And it was a story about uh, the uh, flight from slavery to be protected by Union soldiers at Camp Nelson and Camp Nelson was the uh, third largest recruiter of black soldiers uh, during uh, the Civil War era. So there were uh, large numbers of uh, black soldiers who were able to protect and defend uh, those fugitives uh, who were able to escape during the Civil War and after uh, at uh, Camp Nelson. But more importantly here, again, there is a unity on the part of 
a divisive era in our uh, nation's history. Not only was Lucy present at Camp Nelson, but my mother's family members were also present at Camp Nelson. Okay? So Lucy was escaping uh, to be protected and those who were her protector were my mother's family members. And in this case is Brian Green. Uh, who was one of the uh, early uh, uh, recruits uh, at Camp Nelson. Mm -hmm. So Lucy's story is a story about uh, uh, division, but it's also a story about uh, you know, people coming together. We, we have a lot of division in our society and culture today, mm -hmm. but there are opportunities yes. for us to heal, mm -hmm. to reconcile, to reckon. And uh, so we have to be about that kind of business in moving forward. But right after uh, the Civil War, there was division in the ranks of the uh, African uh, Predestinarian Baptist Church in Richmond. And that division led to uh, a man a preacher by the name of Leroy Estel breaking ranks in Richmond, Kentucky and moving to Ohio. I apologize, there's so much verbiage there, you can't read that, but that, that's an article about uh, the uh, schism that had resulted in Richmond uh, in the late 1870s and resulted in uh, Leroy Estel coming, it says, to Ohio, and guess where he came to? Loveland, Ohio, to build his new church, okay? And the other pi uh, picture, again, a uh, portion of the uh, uh, thing there shows uh, the connectivity of family groups to one another in connection with uh, the uh, African Baptist Church and also to Loveland. Uh, the lady uh, whose name is Clark, as you see, who's marrying a white in that particular uh, uh, shot, was previously married to Leroy Estel. She was a direct uh, relative of the uh, Hannon Hamilton family group. Okay. And other groups coming out of Kentucky, out of Madison County, coming to Loveland, uh, such as the White family who lived out in Goshen, those uh, were people who were interconnected because of these marriage relationships. So Ruth Clark uh, was the wife of Leroy Estel initially. He died. And then she married James White. Mm -hmm. And we see this over and over and <coughs> over again within the family groups of Loveland and those who worship within the uh, African Baptist, uh, African Predestinary Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. We see this also in terms of when others came with Leroy uh, and their former masters, which was the case in coming to Loveland, uh, they followed behind many of their masters uh, in seeking work as domestics in Loveland. And uh, we see uh, from the uh, research of the Ohio History uh, Connection uh, that there were three churches uh, that formed in Loveland in the late 1870s and 80s. Uh, the uh, First Missionary Baptist, the AME, African Methodist Episcopal Church, and of course, uh, uh, the African uh, Predestinary Baptist Church. And they cooperated, they collaborated with one another they didn't have a, a church uh, building for each one of them, and so they shared a building. Mm -hmm. 
And that was uh, important that it, it, it gave you a, a, an, a sense of the willingness on the part of uh, people to collaborate with one another. They didn't have to go their own separate ways. Uh, and they had a uh, place of worship right down the street here. If you went right down the street to uh, Hill Street, the corner of Main and Hill, that was the place where each one of those uh, church denominations held their uh, worship uh, services. Want to share with you the fact that, uh, you know, the many, many different groups in Loveland were all tied together. In this case, we see the uh, uh, the Ballou Broadus family also coming out of the same area, uh, Madison and Gary County, Kentucky, uh, that our family group had come out of. And uh, uh, it, it's important to recognize just how close and how much they shared historical heritage that we um, we mutually should claim. And it, it's important that uh, uh, the Blues, I know that uh, the Clarks uh, marry into the Blue family. Uh, I know right now that the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Hamilton Hannon connection uh, is in Richmond, uh, Kentucky, and that they are very much a part of a, a blue connection right now. So it, it, it's important that we recognize that uh, this kind of relationship has been uh, there uh, from the very beginning. Here's a picture of uh, John Hamilton and uh, I think John Hamilton looks very much like uh, the pastor of this church, uh, <laughs> Reverend Chris Hamilton. And, and uh, but, but uh, uh, bro bro Brother John Hamilton, when he came to this area uh, in the uh, uh, late uh, uh, 1870s or early 1880s, uh, he encountered a young woman uh, whom he desired, and uh, that uh, encounter resulted in uh, impregnation. Uh, and uh, that's the start of the Hamilton family group. That took place in uh, uh, Hamilton Township, and Hamilton Township is that area where uh, they eventually met was only a mile or two where Uncle Ralph and uh, Cousin Cindy live today. So it's it's that kind of, uh, you know, close uh, kind of a situation. And even though that uh, situation uh, 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 evolved from a uh, legal uh, situation uh, where marriage was uh, encouraged or forced, uh, that marriage lasted uh, 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 during the during the period of, of forever, basically, in, in terms of uh, uh, their uh, uh, coming together and remaining together. And we also point out that uh, John Hamilton became a pastor or, or preacher in the uh, uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church, and uh, the Dues. Uh, the, the, the place where that location was, was, was the uh, place of uh, Miss Kanoy and, and uh, Willie Dews. That was the location of the uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church back in the day. And here's uh, John William Hannon. Uh, this is the uh, uh, father of Esther Hannon, my grandmother. Okay. And uh, it's uh, he was the pastor of the uh, African Predestinarian Baptist Church here in Loveland. And he pastored uh, there for 
years and years. He served as moderator in the uh, uh, Tates Creek Baptist Association, and uh, uh, he was a prominent figure in the uh, 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 area of uh, spiritual growth and development uh, among uh, those he served here in Loveland and within the Tates Creek Baptist Association. Here's a uh, list of the blacks of Loveland. You can see that we represented uh, a pretty good uh, percentage of people at, in 1890. Loveland had a population of uh, just about 732 people in the 1890 census, and uh, there was a pretty good uh, uh, percentage of blacks who were uh, in Loveland at that time. Again, most of them were uh, uh, serving, uh, especially the women, were serving as uh, domestics. Uh, but uh, Loveland was a place where they had an opportunity to uh, come, uh, to migrate to, and to have uh, a chance to uh, uh, receive gainful employment. Here's an opportunity for us to get a grasp of the uh, uh, historical heritage of the African uh, uh, Predestinarian Baptist Church. Uh, there, this, the occasion was the 100th anniversary uh, in 1973, and uh, they pointed out uh, all of the people who were prominent uh, in the uh, uh, history of the uh, church. And uh, at that time, the uh, uh, two leading members uh, of the uh, congregation were uh, Miss Mary. B. Smith, uh, who lived down on Center Street, right across the street from uh, uh, my father and, and our household. And uh, of course, his mother, Sister Esther <coughs> Hamilton. And uh, they were the oldest uh, uh, members of the church at that particular time. And uh, they were the real <coughs> stewards or trustees that uh, uh, took a leadership role in uh, spiritual affairs as well. Here's a picture of uh, <clears throat> Miss Mary B. Smith and also my grandmother with their children. And uh, again, uh, they come out of the same place. They come out of Madison County. Uh, uh, Miss Mary B. comes out of uh, uh, Kirksville. And uh, uh, Kirksville is, is right across uh, uh, into uh, Garrett County. So right there in that area, both the Hannon uh, Clark group and also the uh, uh, Smith group uh, uh, comes from that particular area. There's a, uh, an article from the uh, Loveland Herald, it might sound a little condescending, patronizing, but it it is what it is in terms of how they uh, refer to uh, people of color, particularly people who they felt endeared to. So this tells a little bit about uh, the, the the level of service uh, to the community of Loveland as a domestic uh, that. Uh, uh, Miss uh, Mary B's uh, uh, grandmother had served uh, in the uh, city of Loveland. Mary B. Smith, uh, because of the service that her grandmother had rendered to the Bishop and Coleman family, uh, was enabled to attend uh, Wilberforce University. And uh, Mary B. Smith was very learned, very knowledgeable. And as a result, uh, she was able to uh, take a leadership role in uh, researching and leaving uh, this legacy uh, recorded uh, in connection with the uh, uh, Predestinarian uh, Baptist Church. So, uh, you see all of the prominent names that are listed here uh, in connection with uh, uh, the, the Cobbs, uh, the Baloos, the Rosses, the Hannons, uh, 
and she uh, records this information in terms of uh, their having come to Loveland in the late 1880s and 1890, building that church uh, at the lower end of uh, Chestnut Street. So uh, she was extremely knowledgeable. Fortunately, we know a little bit about the Hamiltons and uh, their uh, connection to the lineage associated with uh, the uh, Merritt family group. Uh, fortunately, we had a, a picture in the uh, photo album uh, that Grandma left to, I think, Aunt Ann, and uh, uh, it was uh, cited Uncle Charlie Merritt. Reverend Merritt of the Lachlan Church. Well, we've come to find out, of course, that uh, uh, doing a, a research, further research, uh, using uh, census records, uh, we're able to find out uh, where Charlie had come from and uh, we're able to find out that he had a connection to John Merritt. Uh, and again, Garrett County uh, is the place of uh, uh, origin on the part of uh, most of the uh, Hannon, uh, Clark, uh, this, uh, and Merritt uh, family groups. <coughs> so uh, you see Charles way down there on the, uh, he's four years old in 1870. Uh, and if you look up at Betty, Betty <coughs> is the mother of John Hannon we alluded to a little bit earlier. So uh, we know that this is the right family and this is our connection to that Hannon uh, group. Here's how that kind of materializes. We see the name Merritt, but as we look at the death certificate, if you look further down, you can see uh, the parents of Martin Merritt, who is a brother of Charlie and Betty. Uh, and if you can see the name of the father, uh, John Merritt. Uh, the name of the mother is listed as Lizzie Royston, okay? Now, if we go to another death certificate, that of Betty, and we look, the same father is listed, John Merritt, but the uh, maiden name of the uh, mother is different. It's, it has a Merritt uh, uh, name. And in this case, you see Yet another death certificate, the oldest of the uh, 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 children of uh, Elizabeth and John Merritt. And in this case, uh, the mother's name is listed as Clark. So it's Clark, it's Royston, and it's Merritt. All of those are connected. And you understand by looking at uh, this uh, probate record, how that came about. John Clark was the slave master and uh, he and his wife Dicey were having problems. It was Dicey who had probably brought uh, Elizabeth uh, into that marriage relationship. And then uh, at, when they were encountering some legal uh, problems, uh, the result was that uh, uh, the slaves were placed under uh, the authority of a neighbor. That neighbor was a Royston, okay? So that's how the Roystons and later on, uh, the Roystons sold uh, slaves to the Merritts and that's how these three surnames had uh, come about. Here's a uh, bill of sale of slaves that indicates uh, that last uh, transition to uh, from Clark to Merritt. It was M-A-R-E-T, but it became M-E-R-R-I-T-T. -T. And of course, Elizabeth uh, is that wife of John Merritt and the mother of uh, our Betty uh, Hannon. It's important to be able to follow these research lines on the part of these people uh, by way of uh, uh, court uh, proceedings. 
uh, and I was able to track them uh, from the indenture of uh, July 1821, uh, where they only had a small group identified. And of course, uh, the the increase they call the uh, uh, the uh, children the increase uh, uh, as a result of uh, years later. So from 1821 to 1832 to 1843, 53 and 55. And so I'm able to follow them and the numbers of all of these who are our relatives uh, as a result of these uh, court proceedings. But I do want you to take a look at uh, that last entry at the bottom uh, right there. Uh, Elizabeth was the oldest, was the matriarch of this enslaved family group. Uh, by 1855, she's uh, uh, devalued as a human being and uh, uh, being referred to as an old woman worth nothing. So it's important to be able to, you know, uh, follow uh, these uh, uh, church uh, records and identify the people. Uh, our grandmother Esther is in this with uh, Grandpa Alvy, one of the few pictures where <laughs> they're together. Uh, and uh, our uh, my father and uh, some of my aunts and uncles are also seated in, in front here. And these people at the Predestinarian Baptist Church were able to uh, observe or record a lot of their uh, records as a result of what they had learned uh, from their masters. And uh, it's important for us to be able to see uh, uh, that the Tates Creek Baptist Association uh, was largely uh, the uh, uh, spiritual effort on the part of a man by the name of Andrew uh, Tribble. And that name is important, and it's important for us to be able to recognize, that, again, the connectivity on the part of uh, uh, people and their role within history on a contemporary basis. Uh, we, we often don't make those distinctions, but you see here uh, the date 1846. 1846 has a relevance uh, to me in connection with the Randolph uh, heritage in Piqua, but it also has a relevance associated with the uh, African Predestinary Baptist Church that was founded in 1846 as well for the uh, black people of Richmond who were enslaved by their masters who came out of uh, Virginia. So it's important, again, to have a recognition of an inclusive historical heritage. Uh, the Randolph narrative in Piqua in connection with manumission is also tied to the uh, story of uh, this man named Tribble who had an impact upon uh, the nation as a whole. And it's an important reason, again, why black history is American history and ought to be, you know, appreciated and acknowledged. Uh, and those who are involved uh, ought to be having uh, some level of uh, insistence upon inc an, an inclusive historical heritage tied to those connections. Tribble was largely uh, rumored to be the uh, emphasis upon uh, Thomas Jefferson in connection with uh, his uh, governance uh, procedure or policies uh, in uh, developing the Declaration of Independence. So again, that's a direct kind of connection between our people and our uh, connectivity to the uh, 
historical heritage associated with the African Predestinarian Baptist Church. Tribble uh, counseled Jefferson, and Jefferson was cognizant of the one man, one vote kind of uh, uh, situation that was afforded uh, to those who uh, worship within the Baptist Church. Uh, at that time, if you were a uh, member and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, uh, then you had the right to cast a ballot and vote in church affairs. That was something that he had shared with uh, Jefferson and that Jefferson uh, acknowledged uh, was an important uh, part or role in uh, the uh, incorporation of uh, that concept in uh, the founding of the United States. Mm -hmm. We're getting to the end here, but I wanted to make sure that uh, the other part of my uh, family group here, the Green uh, family, uh, was also uh, uh, acknowledged. Uh, this is this is one of these uh, unbelievable stories to me, uh, and most of us in Loveland are aware particularly those of us who have a little age, we're aware of who Mary B. Smith was, but we aren't familiar with this Mary Smith. This Mary Smith was someone that is being written to from somebody in Zenith. And uh, this uh, particular person in Xenia is a, a man by the name of Shelton O'Rear. And Shelton O'Rear is sending this postcard to his niece in Loveland. The date is 1912, and Shelton is saying, hey, I'm dying, basically. And I just wanted to you know, let you know uh, the circumstances of, that uh, uh, are uh, associated with my failing health. And I want you to take care of some things uh, that are important for me to share with you. So who is that Mary Smith? Well, Mary, that Mary Smith was uh, uh, married to Patrick Smith. Patrick Smith uh, married this Mary O'Rear. They came to Loveland in the uh, late 1870s. They bought the house that Uncle Allie and Aunt Nancy uh, lived in uh, at the corner of Hill and Maine. That same house was later uh, purchased by uh, Bill Cobb. Uh, these people were early. They were the earliest of my family groups who were connected with Loveland who came uh, to uh, uh, this community and uh, it also uh, tied, made that uh, tie in connection with Willie O'Rear and Maria Coons and uh, you see the story here of Shelton O'Rear uh, who is now dead uh, but uh, an obituary allows us to see some additional family connections with ties and one of those ties is to a Miss Rachel Hughes. It's interesting, but that Hughes is a part of the Hughes family that, yeah, that lived here uh, in the, the greater Loveland area or Milford, Camp Denison area. And uh, Again, our, our Green family members uh, can look at this picture and readily identify Aunt Lucy, uh, Frances Marie, uh, but the other women, some of you might not uh, identify, uh, Billy, this is uh, uh, Nanny Sue Benton. And uh, this is uh, 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 Matt Green's uh, aunt, uh, his mother's sister. And again, these kinds of connectivities are, are, are important. Uh, this is a, a segregated social column in the uh, Xenia newspaper. The date is February 22nd, 1924. My mother 
wasn't even born yet. My mother's now 97 years of age, but I can deduce from the uh, newspaper article that she was conceived. <laughs> yeah, she was conceived. But look, it says Mr. and Mrs. Matthew Green of where? Of Loveland were Sunday guests of Mr. and Mrs. H.C. Scott of Four Acre Street. Well, Mrs. Scott was a nanny Sue uh, uh, Benton uh, who married this uh, gentleman named Scott and later on would be Ferguson. But these kinds of things are important and what I'm getting to here is that there is such an interrelatedness and connectedness associated with our family groups. The Hamilton family group by way of uh, uh, L uh, Lydia Morgan uh, through the uh, Lane family uh, also settled in Xenia and uh, the uh, Benton uh, family members uh, had uh, a descendant by the name of uh, Sanford uh, Clay Evans and they actually married. So the Hamilton line and the Green line married in uh, Xenia, Ohio. And I've actually tracked down uh, this uh, particular relative in uh, California. So who do you think you are? Better whose you are matters. Who you are. It's whose you are, it matters who you are. It's important for us to uh, establish our priorities in life. Yes, sir. Okay? And uh, what we are about is trying to proclaim a, uh, a, a spiritual uh, heritage that is inclusive of all. And this is what God is, is saying to us in allowing us to uh, accept uh, his son's uh, uh, crucifixion and resurrection as the foundation upon which uh, we become his children of light. Okay? So we need to, as, as uh, Duane I think was uh, uh, pointing out earlier, we need to be about the business of glorifying God. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and recognizing uh, him as the light in a world of darkness. There, you know, we are in perilous times. We are in perilous times. And, 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 and the more we uh, recognize uh, God's word uh, and are able to uh, implement it uh, in our lives, we uh, serve <coughs> as that temple. And, and uh, the more we are uh, able to uh, uh, glorify him, uh, our testimony uh, perhaps is able to lead others uh, to Christ in these dark and perilous times. But it's also important to me uh, to memorialize the struggle for freedom. Uh, by way of the wisdom of the ancestors. Eh? And I know that that's something that most people are indifferent to, <coughs> unfortunately. But it, it, it's, it's my purpose for being. I know that uh, it, it's why I am who I am or whose I am in terms of understanding who I am. That matters to me. I, I shared with you the, from the from the get go. I am only one, but I am one. Okay. It doesn't matter to me that a lot of people are indifferent or can't get into what it is that God has gifted me with in terms of my ability to share with others. I would love it if people were receptive. Uh, to uh, my call upon my life in terms of my service to uh, the community of color. Mm -hmm. That ain't happening. But hey, lots of people rejected uh, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and later came to a recognition 
that uh, there was something uh, more uh, substantial, more important in terms of uh, who they would become in terms of their opportunities for uh, eternal salvation. So these things are important. I'm going to stop there, uh, but it's important for uh, you to recognize that there are opportunities for us to move forward. Uh, you know what? I would be disobedient if I stopped there because I've got more. I, 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 I can look and see <laughs> that others may wish that I would stop, but that's not going to happen because I've got a responsibility and, and God is telling me it's not about their acceptance of you. It's about what it is that I've given you a commitment to perform. So bear with me. We're going to do this. This is what uh, uh, I have long been associated with in terms of trying to uh, perform a service to this community. I know that there's a level of divisiveness. I know that uh, uh, we we see this in the in the uh, uh, politics uh, of the state of Ohio. Uh, we see it in the uh, uh, CRT kinds of messaging. Uh, but we need to be about trying to offer solutions that reconcile and heal the divisions uh, within our midst. Uh, I believe God has given me something to at least begin that process and create a dialogue upon which we can move forward together. And the Love Land Initiative is one of those things. The Family Institute, uh, especially in connection with uh, the uh, opportunity to link family groups that were separated by way of the enslavement narrative, by way of a biological recognition that we could literally be related, might be a means by which we can come together. Might be a means by which we can, you know, offer hope uh, for uh, a reckoning, a reconciliation. And that family institute is what I envision being located right here at the end of Chestnut Street. But that only happens when people have a level of worth associated with their, you know, lives and valuing their ancestors and the struggle for freedom that they endured on their behalf. So these are things that uh, we have to recognize. Uh, you know, uh, they talk about their ancestors. Uh, it's time for us to start talking about our heritage and our inclusion within uh, that historical uh, narrative. Last thing here, we're now focus so much on um, uh, the war, the international war in, uh, in Europe and Ukraine. If we understand our DNA and the role of DNA, this, this <coughs> might allow us to have a recognition of how it is that we are more sensitive and empathetic to uh, people's uh, plight and their struggles for freedom elsewhere. This is my heritage. My DNA says that, hey, while I recognize that I'm a West African overwhelmingly, there's just a part of my DNA, if you look, that says, hey, uh, your lineage is also associated with Ashkenazi Jews. It just so happens that uh, 
uh, Vladimir Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, has a Jewish background. And if you look at the map, Poland and Ukraine is a part of that area that represents, uh, you know, my uh, heritage, my biological DNA tied to uh, that, uh, that story. I think that there's enough connectivity if we brought the same level of awareness of our biological DNA to America and the struggle for freedom that we are currently uh, involved in, in terms of trying to uh, establish uh, our worth and dignity in terms of being uh, brought into an inclusive historical heritage. Amen. So these are things that we all have to, uh, you know, uh, grasp and deal with. Uh, I'm going to leave it with this one last thing because I wanted to honor the women. Okay. And my grandmother, especially. So this is for you, Esther. On motherhood and women I've loved, to a genetic African Eve along the Nile, to slave Liza Clark, an old woman worth nothing reviled. To Esther Hannon Hamilton, a matriarch profiled, to my mother so dear, Mary Frances Green, and to Linda, wife and mother of my children, an African queen. The greatest gift a father can give his children is to love their mother. I don't have to wait to get your approval in terms of honoring those who've gone before me and paved the way for me. I built and I honor those I love. This is a flagpole monument in my uh, yard in front of my house. We don't have to wait. We can do these kinds of things on our own. If we want to reflect that kind of love for those who've gone before us Amen. and who are worthy of being memorialized. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless you, sir. And I, I have a great time. Thank you. Yes. And to all of you, young people, yes. you can reach for the sky. Do it. God bless you. Gracious God, we thank you for this great day. We ask you, if you will, to please enable us to follow through and to realize that we can reach for the sky. Thank you, dear God, for Jesus, for it's he who has brought us a mighty long way. Help us to do thy will and bless those who are present and those who are absent. Mm -hmm. And will we continue to be what we are supposed to be? Mm -hmm. And that is that God made us to be a participant in this world. Let us do that. Let us rise to the highest level, mm -hmm. for it is attainable. Mm -hmm. God bless you. Amen. Thank all that has been said and done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.